bumblebee. Thought I'd try to learn some sort of difficult pigging Russian thing so that everything after this couldn't possibly feel as difficult. Today, you will learn a lot about the chemistry involved in varnishing and the drying or oxidative polymerization of oil paints and um, the way that that will affect which colors you choose for your Camayu underpaintings, as well as some information about studios and studio setup to maximize drying and control of light. So lots to discuss. Let's waste no time. Let's talk about which room you might want to select for your studio. This is the Earth. This is the North Pole. Celestial North Pole. And this is the equator. On June 21st, the longest day of the year, we see the most sun in the nor northern hemisphere. If you live in the southern hemisphere, it's the opposite. Um, on March 21st and September 21st, it appears that we have equal amounts of sunlight and moonlight as the path of the sun is close to the equator. If you lived um, somewhere on the equator, the, it might look like you get 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of moonlight um, all the time. But we're in the northern hemisphere here, and actually really most of the human population lives in the northern hemisphere. And then uh, this is the sun's path on December 21st when we would see the least light. This is when it's the darkest part of the year for those of us living in the northern hemisphere. So you know that you can use a mall stick to help yourself balance if you're painting on something like Okay, you also know about using newspaper in your studio so you can dab off excess oil for fat over lean layering and dry brush scumble techniques. Um, you know about marking your paintbrushes and you know about using Viva brand paper towels because they don't um, leave fibers on the painting, but you could also use old t-shirts. Uh, another thing about your studio is if the work is very large, make sure there is enough space to see the entire image at once, as well as considerations for stretching, glazing, varnishing, storage, and framing. You need, you may need a step ladder if you're painting a surface um, that is super tall so that you can keep your eye in the center of your own perspective as you paint, so that you're not looking at something from below or from the side. You really want to be able to look at it straight on. You also want to make sure that you have enough space to back all the way away from the painting so you can see it in full. Um, for ergonomics and self sound proofing in your studio, pad the floor. I have a bunch of workout mats underneath a carpet in my studio. Make sure that you use some kind of drop cloth to prevent the materials from getting out of hand. A room that faces north, like I said, it's going to have the most controlled light. The controlled light is important it, for an observed subject in your studio, but also so that as you work on a painting for several hours, the light isn't changing significantly as you go and just adding like more redundant work to what you're doing. You want a consistent light. Um, opaque dark paint does absorb more light, so when you are col coloring the walls of your studio, um, you know that white light's going to bounce a lot of light around. You're going to see a lot of reflected light in the room. Uh, if you have orange walls, you're going to see a lot of orange reflected light. It's going to change the way that you perceive color. Same goes for blue, any color. So actually, if you can paint the walls of your studio black, you're going to have a lot of control over the light in your studio. Um, Wall color will create a tint in the atmosphere of the room and color all the shadows. You're also going to want to light your painting surface directly. Your painting surface might be a canvas. Um, and you're going to want to use a neutral bulb. Multiple bulbs, like track lighting, can help create more even light in a space. 
Bare bulbs are great for lighting objects for observation with dark, low-key, dramatic shadows. Track lighting and floor lamps are especially helpful because you can move them around so much and um, if you can find a floor lamp with multiple heads on it, which I know you can find at Ikea, um, these are great, super great. So again, you can use black velvet, as you know, to it's the ultimate light absorbency. The fabric and the color will both um, absorb a lot of light and it also can be a removable jack backdrop or it can just control specific shadows. Um, colored pieces of construction paper can also be used to control reflected light colors. So if you're working on an object and it has an unusual form or something irregular and you just are struggling to understand what side is actually um, needs to be like the brightest side or a darker side, like what is the actual form of the object and how are you conveying it? If you use colored construction paper, you can use multiple colors of construction paper to identify where light is bouncing onto an object. Mirrors are also useful for correcting drawing errors and design imbalances as well as creating dramatic reflected light. Um, Consider creating a color chart that shows some tints, tones, and glaze layers handy so that you could hang on a nearby wall. Uh, that means if you have a painting and you're doing it in a grisaille and you're wondering how does ultramarine blue lay on this grisaille, you can have a value scale in gray and then you could in one smooth stroke of ultramarine blue, you could just lay it across the whole value scale so that you can see the way that it's going to affect things. But you can do the same thing with any kind of comma U painting. Hard to spell. Probably spelled it wrong. Um, so Verdi, Brunei, um, Siraj, anything that you want to understand how colors will lay. So you could do like a camayu of the Siraj colored underpainting and you could do multiple value scales and cover those with, you know, uh, terra verde or whatever you, you're going to use in your palette. Um, your, these colors that you will glaze with, you'll determine based on Fat Berlin properties um, watch the last episode if you need help selecting uh, which paints actually should be laid over top of others. And that alone, once you understand the chemical properties of the different paints and the pigments, you'll have a better understanding of how to limit your palette. And so when you create this kind of a huge like color chart, you don't have to go through every tube of paint that you have or every tube of paint that you could buy. You know that only certain colors will be laid over top of others. And let's say that you did do a glaze of ultramarine blue over a Siraj Kamayu painting, and then you did another value scale that's also covered in the ultramarine blue. Then you can put a second glaze layer in maybe that terra verte or whatever other color you might be using. and. Um, see the way that those two lay over each other and then you could do the reverse. You do terra verde with a second glaze of ultramarine blue. You can see that it gets pretty laborious um, but it is really helpful because glazing is probably one of the least predictable ways to color a painting. Okay, It, it can give you the most control but only if you actually know what the big red button does. So also in your studio, rolling cards like bar cards are so useful for accommodating accessible tool storage within arm's reach. They have like a zillion cute ones on Wayfair. I have this one, it's like this, and it has a mirror top and a cute little handle. And you would like expect it to be covered in like bottles of alcohol, but instead it's just covered in bottles of uh, like, Damara varnish or Gamsol. So it's like super chic, but it's so nice because you can wheel it around. 
Um, and if you're working on something that's gigantic, it's just nice that you can go from over here to over there and you can have your palette like just resting on it. You can have your brushes all accessible and such. It's so useful. Um, it's also, like I said, chic. So brushes should be stored so that the filaments are not deformed by any pressure. You can just set them like up in a cup with their uh, filaments facing upwards, or you could create like a pegboard, like in your dad's garage, where you can hook your brushes so that their filaments face downwards and you are able to allow any kind of liquid from accumulating in the ferrule and instead it can run off of the tip of the filament. Um, for those really fine brushes, it's going to be probably better for you to use some kind of a clip or a clamp to hold them because you can't really put a hole through them to stick on a pegboard. Okay, so using gravity. Um, another thing about storage in your studio is you will want to set up something so that your tubes of paint rest slightly upwards. You don't really want them to sit totally tall like with their cap uh, at the top. The idea is that the tubes of paint are something like pigment and like binder and oil or just like potentially if you got something really good, pigment and oil. Um, and they're mixed together really well with that muller and if it's sitting up all the time, depending on the weight and density of the pigment, it could rise to the top and the oil could sit in the bottom of the tube or um, vice versa. But if the tube of paint, worst thing you could do is put the tube of paint so the cap is facing down because the oil is going to find its way out and seep out all over the place and you're going to be left with a bunch of pigment in there that's really much drier than it's meant to be and its consistency is a mess. You've just messed up your paints big time. So um, make sure that they're like slightly upward so that they just don't seep out. And really the way that the tube of paint is made, it's made so that the the side with the cap does sit a little bit taller than the back of it. But um, elevate it just a bit more so that this isn't like, you know, going to have anything seeping out of it. Um, the other thing is that when the paint leaks out of the cap, it makes a mess and it makes it, if it hardens, it makes it pretty difficult to replace the cap. I mean, you can pick the paint off of it, but that's just a mess that you don't need and you could just store your paints properly. So also, as a painting dries, whether that's your Camayu layer or one of your glazing layers or your varnish, um, you don't want dust and debris and impurities to settle on the wet surface. So I recommend that you, this is a vertical wall and this is the floor. I recommend that you lean your painting so that the face of the painting faces down into the corner so that anything flowing around in the air isn't sticking onto the surface. And just put like a paper towel or something at the bottom in case there's a little bit of something running down. But don't store it like totally um, or like just too, too far because you don't want to like mess up the way that the oil is drying. Like you don't want it to run down too much. Okay, so just that also just depends on how much oil you have on the surface of the painting. But generally, you can lean the painting against a wall with its face facing down to prevent some things from getting stuck. And also, this is not a permanent storage solution because this could cause the canvas to warp. Whenever you store your canvases in your studio, they should, like, when it's permanent, they should be stored face to face. Okay, so. These are two faces and they're kissing. Mwah! Okay, this will help prevent warping just because it's gonna like even the pressure out of the stretcher beams and the canvas itself. And like, if your painting is wet, obviously it could stick to the other painting. So this is only for permanent storage between shows and such. 
Also, on your easel, they never seem to be the right size, do they? Easels. I have, an, I have a lovely French easel, and guess what? It doesn't hold, like, the paintings in the size that I'm working on. It's always a problem. But you can add extensions. It's not that hard. You really just need some measuring tape, and then you can add something, like, just an extra long um, shelf for the bottom of the painting, and, like, maybe it extends up to here, but, like, your painting's much taller. You can actually just like take that part off and replicate it and make it like so much bigger that gets to be like a lot of work this is a lot easier to just add an extension at the bottom okay um so now it's time for the myth busters section of um this episode people will tell you all different things about how an oil painting dries so we're just going to get rid of the word dry, and we're going to say cure. But honestly, cure is a silly word too. It doesn't mean anything. We're polymerizing. This is what is actually happening to an oil painting as it solidifies. I mean, you already knew an oil painting doesn't dry. Or somebody told you oil paintings take hundreds of years to dry. That probably came out of my own mouth at some point. Um, what they really do is they take hundreds of years to completely solidify and finish polymerizing. So, um, while a painting is polymerizing, you have a duty to protect it from various things. One thing you can skip is having a fan in your studio. Some people will say that that helps with the curing. It actually will just create a mess because it will blow light material around in your studio, like papers and stuff. But it also does not change the oxygen, oxygen content of a room. So polymerization is all about oxygen. Our atmosphere, 20% oxygen, about 80% nitrogen. There are some impurities, but it's pretty much evenly this ratio everywhere. Um, so polymerization is, here we go, O2 molecules. These are, um, this is a polymer, right? Because we know that a mer, remember that this is a Greek word for unit, okay? Um, O, where it's just one, this is a monomer. Easy, right? So O2 is a polymer. Oxygen molecules are seeking electrons so that they can build a shell around themselves that sort of like completes their um, like molecular like wish. It just completes them on a molecular level. It completes their molecular shell, okay? And so they are out there in the atmosphere looking for those um, electrons and they find them in the surface of your varnished oil painting. Okay. Linseed oil. Oh, look at this. So handy. Um, 57 mers or units of carbon. Um, this one says... 98 hydrogen units and 6 oxygen units. But I've actually read that the hydrogen is different. I've read something different about that before. But anyway, oh, I made a mess. Yeah. Anyway, so. Um, The refined linseed oil has the chemical compound that the oxygen is seeking, and so. What it does is, it's actually mm, bonding with itself. Um, the oxygen goes in and it reacts with different parts of the linseed oil and it just connects the linseed oil with itself. So it gets like tighter and tighter and it joins with all the other molecules around it until it's um, actually a solid. It just makes a tighter solid, okay? so. In a room, you want maximum oxygen content. But like I said, that, that's not that easy because um, 
the atmosphere is pretty consistent. But we'll do what we can about that. So skip the fan though. The fan doesn't add any oxygen to the room. It just blows dust onto your wet painting. Um, one thing that you could do is you could get a tank of oxygen like what a scuba diver has. You could blast oxygen onto the surface of your painting. But um, a compressed oxygen tank is highly flammable, so you probably don't want to do that, especially with all those flammable chemicals in your oil painting studios. So um, another thing that you can do to control dust and dirt is wetting down the floors. Um, if you've lived in a desert area, like when I lived in central Anatolia in Turkey, every morning everybody would wet the floors down, not just in their apartment, but also their sidewalks and the street. Um, and sometimes in midday, just to control the amount of dust in the air. Okay, so actually one thing that can help you with all this dust is just a simple air purifier. It'll just pull some impurities out of the air, keep them away from your surface. Now, a dehumidifier may help oil paints cure more quickly, but we'll come back to that because that's um, actually something that I consulted Mr. Dr. Michael, um, who is an esteemed professor at the University of Delaware. I have been talking to him about this dehumidifier business in the polymerization of oil painting. That's why I know so much about like chemistry, by the way, is because he's my like stepdad. So I have a like super scientist stepdad, and that's how come I can share all this info with you. So anyway, um, a well-ventilated studio may also include open windows, but this can add more pollen, dust, and impurities like that into the air. Plants create oxygen. I am giving you an excuse to buy more house plants right now. The best house plants for this are snake plants. I'll write this down for you so you can just go get this later. So snake plants, aloe vera, which um, these two plants also produce oxygen at night. Okay. Um, orchids, yay. They also banish something called uh, xylene, which is a pollutant found in paint. Okay, so also the Christmas cactus. I don't know if you can see this anymore. Christmas cactus. They have pretty pink flowers. Mm. And uh, the Christmas cactus thrives in dark rooms. They bloom so much more in a dark room. So that means it'll do great in your north facing studio. So basically just fill your north facing studio with Christmas cactus. It's so like Northern European Renaissance. Um, you can also look for philodendrons. You probably already have those in your house and don't even know it if you have like any plants at all. They are like this. They look like hearts. That's a part of their name. Philo, Phil, Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, these are plants that look like hearts and they actually, the name actually means lover of trees because they're like a viney plant and they grow up, tr grow up trees. So you could like get one of those like cool, like gothic fence things from one of the salvage yards in Philadelphia. And you could put some philodendrons on it in your studio. And at the bottom you could plant a bunch of Christmas cactus and you'll have black walls and it'll be in the north of your studio. It'll be so cool. And, We'll have a dehumidifier and maybe some other great tools. Um, this stuff is actually super important because it's going to take your painting a long time with those glazing layers before you're actually able to put the varnish on. The permanent final picture varnish, but we'll talk about that more later. Spider plants, weeping figs, peace lily, and classic ivy. Which is also like totally just Lovely. Okay. So, 
So now we can actually talk about the varnish because now your studio can support varnishing and your studio can also support glazing. Your studio is now oil painting ready. So the addition of pigments to oil is a more recent invention and oil paints as a medium of artistic expression have a history of over 1,000 years. The origins of oil painting, as was discovered in 2008, date to at least the 7th century CE, when an anonymous artist used oil that had been mixed, that had been extracted from walnuts or poppies to decorate the ancient cave complex of Bamiyan, Afghanistan. It's really beautiful. I went to a place in Turkey that was a little similar, different religious group, but basically this one in Afghanistan was a bunch of Buddhist monks um, who did the work and the one that I saw um, in Turkey was actually Christian monks. So um, it's amazing because since they're in caves, the sun hasn't come in to destroy the pigments and they're so colorful. It's amazing. They look like this. They're this colorful. It's amazing. So anyway, um, in Europe, oil painting as a medium was only recorded as early as the 11th century. So not as old. Scientists discovered paintings in 12 of the 50 caves that were created using oil paints from poppy or uh, walnut oil. And if you recall, um, I brought this back from Turkey as well, poppy oil. And I uh, am sure it's available everywhere, but this was the only kind of oil medium that I found when I was in Turkey. I wasn't looking for it, it was just there. So um, it's interesting just, you know, that kind of continuation in materiality. So linseed oil, this dries faster than walnut oil or poppy oil. And walnut oil actually dries faster than poppy oil. Paints made from linseed oil can speed up your painting's drying time significantly. And they're easily found at most supply stores. Um, you will mix linseed oil paints with a solvent like turpentine. Um, another way that you can increase the speed of your painting drying is to use oil paints made from iron oxides for the earth tones, or you can use those iron oxides to create a brunei. I can't write and talk at the same time. Anyway, um, if you use an, uh, an iron oxide earth tone for your Brunei, then your Kamayu painting will dry faster, which is really important. In case you don't remember what I'm talking about with this Kamayu business, this is a Verdi Kamayu painting, and this one is Siraj. This paper that I'm showing to you is from my manual. Um, so, if you need a painting to complete, to like be completed in a, like the fastest time frame possible, like you just got such a great idea for your show that's in like three months, ha <laughs> ha, good luck. But also, um, you can use certain minerals and oils to help that dry faster. So, a linseed oil that based paint made from iron oxides is great for your coming you painting. Um, many earth colors are used. To, Many earth colors used to make paints are made from uh, iron oxide, so that can help things dry several days faster than other pigments. You want to avoid using pigments like ivory black. We've also talked about how black can be warm or cool, and so if a black is warm, it will actually advance in a painting. Um, don't use cadiums. They tend to dry very slowly. Part of what makes these things dry more quickly or more slowly is just the oil to pigment ratio required to get the right kind of viscosity. Excuse me. The right kind of viscosity to the paint. So some 
Uh, it's kind of like how um, sugar dissolves in water. Uh, that root word in there is solve. Okay, solvent, um, dissolve. Um, your pigments, they have different uh, ratios of medium to pigment and these, this is related to how much it dissolves in the medium and to get to a viscosity that makes it uh, sort of fluid. Vis when something is viscous, it's kind of like lava or honey. Okay, so it's like a fluid, but it's like a thick, chunky fluid. Like this um, linseed stand oil, which is linseed oil that's been polymerized. So it's just like this linseed oil, but it's a little bit more solid because of its polymerization and it's actually a little bit more viscous. This is definitely viscous. So, um, avoid ivory black and cadmium paints. Uh, pigments that contain lead or cobalt uh, speed up the drying of paint, while certain organic materials such as alizarin or the two men will slow it down. So, cobalt. Cobalt is also used, um, so it's a faster drying kind of pigment, but it's also a um, accelerant for drying. And it has some issues. It's got some real problems, very serious problems, but we'll talk about those later. So, you can test how fast a paint will dry. When your paints are being manufactured, they test this as well. And some tubes of paint will say it, but you can like Google other ones. You can try your Terra Verde, you can try your Cobalt Blue, um, and you can try your Ultramarine Blue or whatever. Um, just like simply like without adding any medium or solvent, just paint a strip of them and uh, just watch, just test it, you know, it's a laboratory. You can figure out how quickly these different paints will dry and that can also help you determine where in the strata of your oil painting different oil paints belong. So another factor that affects the behavior of oils on the surface is the, the surface. A flat surface, um, like super smooth, something like this, or if you paint on glass, is going to allow pigments and medium to lay out more consistently than something that's like super textural, like a really rough fabric, um, like, uh, like wool, right? Like it's gonna have all of this like depth and texture to it. And so if you lay like an oil paint on top of it, it's going to be like wiggly, it's going to glob up in some areas, it's going to be thinner in other areas. If you are doing a um, like wet on wet painting or something with a lot of texture, like you really love that chunky paint look, uh, like the paint itself on the outside it's going to be affected by the oxygen first. It's going to cause a skin on the outside of the chunk of paint that you've put on your surface and the inside of it will remain viscous for much longer, which also means that as it dries, it's going to crumple down to the surface and flatten out. So um, some of these impressionist paintings that use this impasto paint uh, probably had much more texture at the time that they were painted. However, impurities in the atmosphere are landing all over this um, impasto paint and they're actually like helping describe and enhance the texture vi in a visual way. It's just dust and dirt falling into the wrinkles. Just like my ladies when you fall asleep with your makeup on, right, and this is your eye and your mascara gets all over the place under your closed eye and then you open your eye and it looks like you have like 80 year old wrinkles because the mascara has seeped down into all of it. It's the same way that the impurities are laying over the impasto paint on the surface. 
Um, you also, when you use an impasto paint, like if you have a Damar varnish on the surface of your painting, and later you're going to remove the varnish because it has yellowed, as linseed oil does, um, you have a hard time getting that varnish off of impasto paints. But at the same time, the varnish, uh, it does a lot to protect the paint itself, but we'll talk about that more later as well. So, using a flat surface, using flat paint, better for the painting. Um, better for the painting. So, wood um, and canvas are, uh, depending on like how you treat them, like if you're using your rabbit skin glue powdered marble gesso over the rabbit skin glue sized canvas and you've like rubbed all the dust down into it, then it's probably pretty slick. Um, if it's wood and you've sanded it really with like a very fine tooth grit sandpaper, it's probably fine. Um, but then there's also metal. You can paint on metal, obviously. It has a very luminescent quality to it because of the amount of light bouncing back through the dispersed pigments in the oil medium. And it's actually reflecting and refracting. Um, so it, iron won't have much of an effect on the drying of oils, but copper actually decreases the drying time. Uh, and it also gives a slightly green cast to the oil. So beyond the paint being dry to the touch, they are still very active chemically. And the polymerization process that starts with the intake of oxygen will still be active for years afterward. Even after the effect of the physical property, properties of paint um, film were applied. So both physical and chemical processes are going on in the paint for many years. And that's why they say that paint doesn't then it takes a long time to cure. Um, so in the earliest glazes of your oil painting, in your oil painting strata, this is the surface. Uh, these paints here, let's say that you're doing a brunei. Or, yeah, okay, this is like an iron oxide brunei of some kind. Um, you're going to add a solvent uh, I always recommend turpentine. It's made from pine trees. Um, it's not more toxic than mineral spirits or odorless mineral spirits. It's not. Um, they both smell. There's, I don't know, I think that some 1% person who manufactures mineral spirits tried to tell everybody that it was better than turpentine and that's why people use it because I don't see any scientific reason why it should be better. But I could be wrong. I'll, I'll let you know if I am. I'll edit this video, put a big like X on it. Anyway, I use turpentine as my solvent. Um, so you're gonna put solvent into your paint at this strata, but you are not going to add any medium. There's no addition of linseed oil. Um, so the solvent loosens the paint pigment particles. They're dispersing. And then the solvent will evaporate from the surface. And then let's say that it's like time for your glaze and you go in and let's say you go in with ultramarine blue. Um, this layer, you could add a little bit of medium to help disperse the pigments. You could definitely still use the solvent. The solvent is added to the oil medium directly, okay, on your um, palette, not like, in a cup, you want to keep it clean and separate and also you want to like just have a lot of control over it. You could get some of those very scientific looking little plastic eyedropper tools. Does, is this a good image? Does this look like that eyedropper tool? It even like tells you how much you're like sucking up. Super helpful honestly because if you want to do like another layer you're like, okay, this one has to be more oily. I'm going to need two times as much medium, perhaps. The first layer of glaze, I put this much in. The second one, I can put that much in. And then you have your second little eyedropper tool that you have, that you can use for your solvent. 
the solvent's going to ruin this plastic thing um, because it'll dissolve it. But then you'll know, okay, well I used this much solvent in the previous layer, maybe I'll use half as much. So you're using less solvent as you go, and you're using more medium as you go. And if you use something that, where you can be scientific about how you measure it, you're in a better, better position for success. Um, so, you'll continue to do that. If you use too little oil in an early glaze, it can be too opaque and it will obliterate the uh, Kamayu Brunei, Verdi, Grisai, Sirage, whatever color you chose for your Kamayu painting. It will obliterate the marks that you made. Um, and it can also make the paint too pasty and thick, which is going to be really difficult for you to spread the paint around evenly across, or not evenly, depending on where you're trying to put this layer of glaze. So, oil paints harden. Um, cobalt dryer, this is called a siccative liquid. It speeds up the process of absorbing oxygen from the air. Cobalt dryers, as well as Japan dryers um, and alkyd dryers. These are all siccative liquids. Okay. Cobalt will tint your painting a little bit um, blue and Japan dryer is actually made from cobalt dryer. Um, these alkyd dryers, these are in the family of acrylic paints in that they haven't been around as long, so we don't know what they're doing yet. They haven't been around long for us to see how they age. Um, so now let's get more into the polymerization of the surface of the painting, because it's really interesting if you like chemistry. I mean, who doesn't like chemistry? Chemistry is so fun. I got a perfect score on my standardized tests in chemistry. It was so natural. Anyway, oxidation. Let's start here. Let's make sure this is so clear for you. You are going to be so pro about what is happening to your painting. Okay, Antoine Lavoir Sierre use this term to signify a reaction of a substance with oxygen. Oxygen forms bonds with other elements, bonds such as hydrogen bonds, and it removes electrons in the process. Linseed oil, as you know, is made from hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Carbon is what makes anything organic. One thing that was never natural to me is spelling, which is pretty funny given how many languages I've learned. Um, but maybe that's also why I can't spell anything. So anyway, carbon makes things uh, qualify as organic. Um, so th oh, this is the answer to my own question. The amount of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen in linseed oil varies depending on its extraction method. That is why you will sometimes see different amounts of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Depends on how it was extracted. Cold pressed, heated, okay, just like coffee. Um, so it's derived from the flax plant. Oh, now let's get into my third favorite subject, history. Actually, I'm going to give history my second favorite subject, art, history, chemistry. So, linseed oil comes from the flax plant. It's delicious. I love flax seeds in my uh, everything. Put flax seeds everywhere. Um, a vegan's best friend. Okay, so the flax it, it, is what linen canvas is made from as well. The fiber is very strong and absorbent and it drives, dries faster than cotton. Cotton has a dark and terrifying history thanks mostly to the French fashion industry. So, um, and you know, African transatlantic slave trade. So cotton is 
quite a, a dark fiber, even though it's white. Anyway, so the, the flax thread is not elastic and is more difficult to weave without breaking. This is why cotton became more popular than linen in um, the 17th century when like basically we started to see the, the very beginnings of fast fashion, which was all related to industrialization. Okay, so um, cotton's easier to weave than linen. Um, in Georgian caves near the Black Sea, human use of dyed flax fab fibers has been discovered dating to 36,000 BP. This means before present. 36,000 years ago, humans were using the flax plant to make fibers and they were already coloring them. Okay, Helen of Troy, she was using um, just actually a lot of the same pigments that we use now in her, in the linen fabrics that she wore, which were coated with olive oil to make them like a shiny fabric, like a shiny, brilliant blue fabric from the glands of a sea snail. Um, pretty fantastic. So anyway, and, and that's a prehistory figure as well, Helen of Troy. She's actually Helen of Sparta, but that's another subject. Um, so when oil is absorbed into the fibers of a canvas, polymerization decelerates. So the deepest layers have a long curing time. Since linen is less absorbent on a structural level than cotton, it is better protected from deteriorating or deterioration caused by acidic substances that it comes in contact with. And it is more likely to absorb oil from the painting. This is another reason why it is important to size and gesso your canvas well. Polymerization is the phenomenon of cross-linking smaller molecules to the bigger ones. Okay. Um, each molecule, each mer, you know, it's a monomer. And then when it cross-links and bonds, it's a polymer. And that's actually what makes it the, the totality of the linked atoms is what creates the molecule. The molecule is made of atoms. Um, in the atmosphere of our stratosphere, oxygen is two atoms stuck together, so we have O2. Uh, if you're like way out farther in the strata of our atmosphere, you'll find O3, but that like will like burn you alive. Um, so this is a double bond and both oxygen atoms want to have two electrons more. So each atom is like, I want more electrons. I want two more electrons. Eee! Okay. And um, in quantum mechanics, electrons reside at certain distances from the nucleus. The further the distance of the orbit, uh, it makes more space for electrons. So shells are formed and filled around double bond molecules when all of the electrons are attracted. And then, then um, it'll take some kind of catalyst to break it apart. So the O2, it's like pretty stable. It has all its electrons. Um, it's not seeking more. So in our atmosphere, we have a bunch of shelled, um, electron-filled O2 molecules. Okay. Um, when the oxygen molecule has its stabilizing shells, it's not seeking any more electrons. Um, and we want to break those double bonds because then that will cause those oxygen atoms to seek more electrons. And they will find those electrons in our linseed oil. 
Yeah, Cho. I like it. I'm gonna call it Cho now. This is an oxidative polymerization. So when these single oxygen atoms are like, ooh, you have some electrons. And they're like, wow, let's bond. Okay. So this is how it becomes more solid. So dry climates. Here's the fun, like, big question that I'm, like, working on here, my, my theory. Dry climates are known to accelerate the speed of oxidative polymerization, a high relative humidity during curing and aging of oil paints can be expected to lead to paints that are less cross-linked and in turn be more susceptible to solvent sensitivity. So your painting, your painting surface, your like Damar varnish, the solvent. Oh, I am an art conservator. I must return re remove your Damar varnish so that I may um, clean it because now it's yellow because it's linseed oil. Damar varnish is linseed oil. Um, remove it and re and place like new varnish on the top. So this layer where it's all of your paints and pigments and such has to be well polymerized so that the solvent doesn't actually remove parts of the painting. Okay, so um, when placed in a humid environment, the painting would be less stable than if it had been cured in a low humidity climate. Humidity can also affect the canvas fabric itself, expanding and contracting, eventually warping and cracking the painted surface. Linen is known to dry faster, so logically it absorbs less moisture. Besides cotton and linen, there are some other composite fiber canvases out there that are mostly mixtures of synthetic fabrics like polyester uh, with linen sometimes. Polyester has the advantage over natural fabrics in that it does not absorb moisture, but does absorb more oil. So it can absorb oil from the painted surface, leaving the surface brittle and discolored. Since polyester is processed from crude oil, what? Yuck. I want to support that industry. Just kidding. You can't avoid it. Um, uh, it has the like dissolves like principle in organic chemistry. It is actually one of the most oil absorbent fabrics. The perfect fabric for oil paint is yet to be discovered as natural materials that are oil repellent or super oleophobic are very rare and difficult to synthesize because oils have a very low surface tension and therefore much more of a tendency to spread. The perfect fabric would also have to be super hydrophobic. Did I write these words down for you? They're cool words. Super hydrophobic. And um, the other one was super oleophobic. This one is oil repellent. Okay. And this one is water repellent. So, um, the perfect fabric would also have to be super hydrophobic, water repellent. Um, wood panels warp and even rust inhibiting primer on metal surfaces are difficult for all paints to adhere to, not to mention even steel thermally expands. Less than other metals, but it does. Um, glass expands significantly less, and quartz is one of the least expansive materials, but neither have adequate tooth for adhesion. So do you remember these things? Cohesion, adhesion, okay? Water has the uh, cohesion property. When you have like, um, when you see rain running down your windshield and all the water molecules, they join together, the raindrops join together, that's cohesion. They're attracted to the other O2 molecules because of their hydrogen bonds. Adhesion is um, the way that like water might stick to the surface of your skin. 
Um, adhesion is also why oil paints stick to any surface at all. It's more of a static electricity. It's not a chemical attraction. Um, so, da 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 da. Let's see. So, the truth is out there for your surface, but um, something you could try, something that might be closer to perfect, is if you had a glass panel and you um, put linen over it so that it like actually tucked around the back of the panel and then you put your size medium like rabbit skin glue over it and then you put your powdered marble gesso on top of that because um, anything that has that um, polyester in it which actually um, you gotta watch out for that in materials. Just make sure that like things don't have polyester in them. Uh, it can like suck the oil out of your actual oil paints. So anyway, glass with linen with a size with the gesso with like a pretty smooth surface that still has some tooth so you do wanna rub the gesso down. Um, this will have the least warping and then you will also have tooth on your canvas and actually glass since it is transparent will allow some light to reflect through the back. So you have more play with opacity and transparency in your oil paints. Okay. Um, but you can also just like drop your painting and break it. So the truth is out there. Um, anyway, so sometimes hydrogen dioxide, H2O baby, water. Sometimes this can operate as a catalyst. A catalyst is an intermediary that tears apart the O2 molecules. Well, actually, there's two H's there. But it, um, in the case of polymerization, it's tearing apart the O2 molecules. Um, and then it moves away to repeat the separation on another O2 molecule. For example, water can act as a chemical catalyst in explosions as it can promote the transport of oxygen between reactive sites. So a catalyst transports something between these reactive sites and in this case it's transporting oxygen in the case of polymerization on the surface of a linseed oil varnish or actually linseed oil painting um, or both actually actually. So, um, so hot dense environments will cause water to react explosively, such as a high-pressured water coming from the planet's core to the surface in the form of a geyser. Okay, Rust is a common example of uh, oxidation that occurs as a result of O2 working as a catalyst. However, the reaction of iron and water is very different from oil and water. Rather than explosive geysers, in the case of atmospheric humidity during the curing or polymerization of oil paint, water might operate as an inhibitor. Oh my gosh, it's not even a catalyst. Imagine that. Okay, so if it gets in the way of the operative oxygen catalyst, so the operative oxygen that like is the catalyst for polymerization, um, oxygen is poly. Ah, just kidding. It's not. Um, okay. So, so, um, H2O, it could be an inhibitor getting in the way of the operative oxygen catalyst. Okay. So the oxygen catalyst, this can actually um, be increased with heat and UVA rays. Oil, we know, is hydrophobic, and we'll come back to this, but oil is hydrophobic, also Greek. Um, it is water fearing. It contains carbon. So H2O can not operate as a solvent. Water cannot dissolve oil. Linseed oil 
sometimes is um, can be comprised of 57 oxygen molecules, 5 hydrogen, and 3 oxygen-hydrogen bonded molecules. But um, the hydrogen aspect of water may be inhibiting free oxygen in the largely nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere. So once again, uh, we're calling it CHO. This is linseed oil. H2O, this is water. We want these oxygen molecules. The atmosphere is oxygen, oops, and nitrogen. So, uh, with water in the atmosphere, it could be inhibiting like free flowing oxygen from uh, polymerizing the linseed oil. Could be, okay? That's my theory. Mine, I came up with that. Speculatively, Dehumidifiers may therefore be helpful in the studio, speculatively. A dehumidifier cools air to remove H2O and separate more oxygen into the atmosphere. Ultimately, a consistent low humidity environment is the most stable for controlling the survival of oil paints. Heat guns. Heat guns. Sounds metal. Uh, they can also accelerate curing speed. They make molecules vibrate more, move around more, explore more things, find more electrons to bond with in polymerization. For best results, a heat gun should not exceed 130 degrees Fahrenheit, um, 54 degrees Celsius if you don't speak American. Bonds between atoms may be easier to break at higher temperatures, so if the heat is too high, the paint may crack. Linseed oil yellows as it ages, so with accelerated polymerization speeds, the yellowing may actually be visible before your naked eye. Like heat, UV rays coming out of the sun, they have been proven to be an effective catalyst in the acceleration of polymerization in linseed oil. The molecules absorb UV light and go into an excited state. So there's different kinds of UV light. Um, UV, let's see, there's actually UVC, UVB, UVA, and UVV. So they penetrate to different um, amounts. UVV penetrates the most. Um, it can actually reach something called the substrate surface. Okay, um, the rest of them can penetrate, well, they can reach into ink, coating, and adhesive thicknesses, but um, the UVV actually reaches the, reaches the substrate. However, we really only need the UVA for the polymerization of linseed oil. So, um, they go into an excited state, the molecules, and they are more likely to break apart. This results in those dangling electrons which attract electron-seeking oxygen atoms. <laughs> I have to stop and laugh at my parrot. <laughs> he, he, his love is so strong. Anyway, back to science. So, the, if the UV lamp is left on the painting past surface polymerization, it can continue to excite and then destabilize the molecules causing eventual embrittlement and intense light discolor paint. Uh, intense light can discolor paint pigments. Um, that's why like art museums don't put like super bright spotlights on paintings. You have to wait for your eyes to adjust as you stare at it. So if you're just running through an art museum, quickly glancing at things, you actually aren't giving your eyes enough time to um, interpret the correct colors. Uh, and also, um, that's the same reason why those cave oil paintings still look so 
um, chromatic is because they are not uh, being affected by UV light at all. So, or not intensely anyway. So, it's so fun. You okay. So. Like heat, UV light has been proven to be an effective catalyst in the acceleration of polymerization in linseed oil as well. The molecules absorb UV light and go into an excited state where they are more likely to break apart. So there are different kinds of UV light. There's UVC, UVB, UVA, and UVV. Okay. UVV actually can penetrate to substrative, substrative layers, um, but that's actually more than what you would need for the polymerization of your linseed oil surface. You actually just need UVA rays. So a black light light bulb produces these, sunlight produces these, um, and they excite the molecules, which helps break them apart breaks apart molecules so that they go seeking electrons elsewhere and that will speed up polymerization. But if a painting is left under UVA light for too long, it can actually destabilize substrative layers of uh, the painting and uh, cause embrittlement. Okay, so they can disrupt the areas that are already polymerized. Intense light can also discolor paint pigments. So if you think about those um, poppy seed uh, oil paintings in Georgia inside of caves, or not Georgia, Afghanistan inside of caves, um, there's no sunlight getting in there, no UVA light, no light really at all, and so those pigments have retained the intensity of their chroma. Um, and so if you leave your pigments under UVA light for too long, you can, um, you know, disrupt the chroma of your paints. Okay, so those dangling electrons, they're seeking other oxygen atoms that are seeking electrons and that can help polymerization solidify the surface of the painting. Um, after curing, glass can protect paintings because it absorbs UV light. Okay, it does, UV light. You'll see, like, um, if you go to the New Museum, I believe this is how it's spelled, in New York, um, it holds, like, probably the world's greatest collection of Klimt paintings. Everybody loves Klimt. I love Klimt, too. We all love Klimt. Um, I've actually been to the Leopold Museum in Vienna where Klimt lived and worked and we have in the new museum in New York a way much more expansive collection of Klimt's work because um, basically like Klimt was Jewish, he painted a lot of Jewish people, and when they left Germany, they were obviously the wealthier Jewish people. Um, if you're having like an oil portrait of yourself by a famous contemporary artist done at that time, you're pretty wealthy. So they were escaping to the US with their paintings, and that is why we have more here than they have in Vienna. Um, anyway, all of the paintings by Klimt in the New Museum are behind glass, the UV light is protecting them, or the UV, absorption of the glass is protecting them from that light. Um, so cross-linked linseed oil will protect a painting from some types of damage, but over time it may decompose due to intense UV light if it is um, there, if it is present. Uh, then the pigments will start to fade as they absorb light. The pigments also absorb light, um, as you know. Linseed oil is analogous to glass in that it is clear since we can see the painting, but glass absorbs UV light rather than reacting to it. 
UV protection glass has something like a sunscreen coating on the surface to offer further protection, just like your sunglasses. They're just coated with UV protection. Um, for curing, a black light light bulb contains mostly UVA wavelengths, which is good, that's what we want. Um, these help our skin produce vitamin D as well, and they can also cause bacteria on dirty hands to glow, so especially useful during this um, global pandemic. Anyway, so cobalt dryers, again, cobalt dryers. Uh, these are accelerants that contain salts that are proven to bubble to the surface over time and cause cracking in the surface of the paint. These can be used to greatly increase the speed of polymerization. Cobalt compounds are considered very toxic on a scale from one to six. Cobalt compounds are considered a five according to the scorecard, thescorecard.org, a pollution information agency. Grumbacher, that's this. Grumbacher Cobalt Dryer claims it is the only sicative that has been scientifically proven to be the least harmful to use in fine art painting. That's all it is. That's all that they're proving. They've only proved that this is the least harmful sicative. Okay, these are also sicatives. Any liquid that's helping your oil painting dry a little faster, that's a sicative. The word sicative really only means a liquid that helps with drying. Um, yeah, it speeds drying. It's the only one proven to be the least harmful. It doesn't, that which literally means nothing, okay? It doesn't mean that it's safer for your painting, and it doesn't mean that it's safe. It just means it's the least harmful for fine art painting. So because it is extremely strong, cobalt dryer should be used sparingly by applying it in drops. It should not be mixed directly into oil paints but first mixed into an oil painting medium. So you would put a little bit of sicative cobalt dryer into your refined linseed oil, not into the paint. So let's see, um, this is gonna make the paint dry very fast. This is gonna make the oil polymerize faster, right? So if you're doing a painting and this is the surface, and then this is your first layer, your Camayu layer. Well, you don't want to add any oil into the paint at this level. So how are you going to add the sicative if you can't add it directly into the paint? Um, this will make Cobalt dryer will make your oil painting dry in a matter of hours or polymerize in a matter of hours. So you can really only use it on the lowest strata of the painting. Um, but as I said, it's scientifically proven to cause salts to bubble to the surface of the painting. And this is what they think is actually causing the cracks in the painting. Why are the cracks in the painting such a big deal, right? Like some people think that they're quite charming in an oil painting, that they sort of indicate the age of the painting. Well, if you like that cracked look, you can just use a heat gun and it'll crack right there. So the cracks in the oil painting. If you have a, ever had a garden and you've watered it, you might notice that there are like these big like desert looking cracks, um, like after a hot day. It's because the, all of the water is lower in the strata of the dirt and as the top dries or hardens or even polymerizes into something smooth it's still wet down here and then when this dries it can only push the top apart so the longer that it takes for the lowest layer to dry compared to the top layer the more time there is for the cracks to form and the cracks will widen and widen and widen until they're like deep ridges and it could go right through the face of your portrait or um, it's gonna be disruptive visually. So that's why we don't want the cracking. Like you might not see it 
um, for like 50 years, but then, you know, if you end up with, you know, a museum in New York and Vienna holding your paintings behind UVA glass and they're cracking, well, that's sad for progency, isn't it? It's sad for the reputation that you spent your life building. Um, they'll all be like, wow, this person really didn't know how to use his oil mediums. Oh, ha, ha. So anyway, um, uh, another thing about the cobalt dryer, any cobalt dryer, Japan dryer is actually cobalt dryer as well. Um, the drying time, curing time, polymerization time is reduced. It accelerates. So leveling is also reduced and brush strokes and marks may show more. So this is actually very useful if you do like to paint with a lot of impasto paint. So here is your paint blob on the surface. And we know that the outer shell is polymerizing and hardening. And that as the core of this blob um, polymerizes, the whole thing will sink. But if you add a cobalt dryer into the medium and the paint, because for you to even put um, a wad of impasto paint on a painting, it has to be on the surface. So it's on the surface, so you're gonna put the most medium in it. So that means you can add cobalt dryer to the medium and that will help the whole wad polymerize much faster. Um, and it will help stop that um, impasto wad of paint from falling to the surface. It will keep it upright. And then you also know that you can add some cold wax medium to this. We've talked about that before. Cold wax medium. So anyway, um, tips for the impasto painters. Um, so, an appropriate use of the cicative, uh, if, would actually, if you're not an impasto painter, another appropriate use for it is, let's say that you're doing a landscape and you have no interest in the, um, like, an impasto paint technique. So this, this is a Verdi by Jean-Baptiste. Um, little scene of India. It doesn't have any glazing on it. The whole thing is just done. Uh, it's a toned canvas and the painting itself is done in greens. I would guess Terre Verte. It's the pigment that he used. Um, he's French. It's green. It's an old pigment. It's probably Terre Verte. So, um, back here in the painting, this is very thin paint that's just laid on top of the toned canvas. And if you used a cicative here, this is, this is practically no paint. So it's like one layer. The strata is very thin and so if the cicative is going to bubble to the surface, you aren't going to really see cracks because the whole surface is exposed. It doesn't have layers on top of it. The other thing is that it really helps a lot with illustrating depth to keep those furthest areas with the thinnest paint and also um, no glazing, no oils in those backgrounds. It will really help them recede in space. Um, so you could, if you're not interested in using a cobalt medium as a secative in impasto paint, you could use a cobalt medium to help you have a fast drying layer in the back of the painting. But since it's not like layers and layers of glazes, it's almost questionable why you would um, really even bother with that at all. So, varnishes. Ah, right? What a misleading title to this episode. Because now we're talking about varnishes. There are many kinds of varnishes. Okay, this particular one, I have to use sticky notes on some of my mediums because I have so many and um, I don't want to use them wrong, wrongly. So 
Damar varnish protections for paintings that have cured or been curing for six to 12 months. And they claim that it is non-yellowing, but we know it's made from linseed oil. So, hmm. Anyway, varnishes are used to protect paintings. Varnish is yellow and impurities adhere to the surface as they age. So for conservation, the surface layer will be removed and a fresh varnish will be applied in the future. Various varnishes produce distinct aesthetic effects from high gloss finishes to dull finishes. Um, someone might remove the varnish from your painting like 400 years after you put it on. So, but you may also be removing these because this is, this is not actually a final varnish. This is a protection for something that has been curing for six to 12 months. So, artists retouching varnish Artists retouching varnish is an excellent varnish for protecting uh, artists' oil paintings until they are sufficiently dry for final varnish. It will also brighten the sunken in areas of your painting. What does that mean? Why do people keep saying sunken in? Let's talk about it. Let's also try to spell it. Sunken in. So, the texture of your canvas the paint on the surface. It's going to take the form of the canvas and it's going to catch and reflect light in um, more diffused ways. So it's really just like not reflecting those light wavelengths back to the um, cones inside of your retina of your eye the same way because it's uh, it's just not catching the light the same way. If you put the varnish on top of it, varnish as a transparent um, material will help the pigments become more reflective again. And when light reflects to your eye in a very like direct way, you can read the color more clearly. Like if you look at this color straight on versus if it's turned on its side, the way that it reflects light to you really changes the way that you understand the color. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that's what this sunken in business is all about. Some of the terms that artists use are not scientific and they're more intuitive. It makes perfect sense, right? But it does make it um, a bit of a jargon. So artists matte varnish is a non-yellowing UV resistant artists matte varnish that is removable with a solvent such as mineral spirits or turpentine. It's also supposed to be non-yellowing and it's something that you wouldn't use on a painting until it's completely dry which or cured which is supposed to take like 6 to 12 months. Now um here is some matte varnish. You actually would mix this with gloss oil varnish. You would mix these together to manipulate the matteness. Like, do you want it to be totally matte? Or would you rather it be um, something between, like, quite glossy and matte? It gives you a lot of control, which is nice. Because when something's very shiny, it becomes difficult to photograph. So. FYI, before you varnish your painting with Damar varnish or gloss varnish, anything, that's probably when you want to photograph the painting because it gets much harder once it's got a shiny surface. It's harder to light. Everything about it is harder um, to digitize, okay? And since we're now going to live in this digitized art world, which makes me sick, um, we better prepare for that, I suppose. Ah! Anyway, uh, art artist gloss varnish, um, removable general purpose gloss varnish that dries into a non-yellowing glossy finish. These descriptions that I'm reading to you are from the manufacturer's um, horse's mouth. They are 
the way that they describe them in sales. That's why I keep saying non-yellowing, but I don't believe that they're non-yellowing. Um, we could totally run a test. We could, you know, spread these out with a brush on a pane of glass and hit them with a heat gun or, you know, let them um, do their oxidation, polymerization, and judge them from there. I have not done that test myself, but maybe in the near future. Damar varnish, a water white liquid which dries to a non-yellowing glossy finish and is used as a general purpose gloss varnish. Okay, satin varnish, UV resistant varnish, removable with artist um, mineral spirits or turpentine, a solvent. Do not use until painting has cured for six to 12 months um, and do not use as a medium. So that's different, okay? Don't use it as a medium because honestly, you can use Demar varnish as a medium because it's really just refined linseed oil in a slightly different um, molecular composition. Picture varnishes, okay? That's, this is the big finale. Okay, these should be used exclusively to cover the well-dried finished painting. Picture varnishes should neither be used as a painting medium nor for retouching needs. Only for covering the absolutely cured surface of the painting, so it will need to cure for 18 to 24 months. After that period, it is recommended that you protect the painting from dust, dirt, smoke, scratches, and so on. Apart from the protective properties, when picture varnish protects the ah, paint layer against moisture, gases, dust, and to a certain extent from the effect of sunlight, picture varnish improves the optical properties of color in the painting. Helps with the sunken in paints. Um, it's sort of like just the way that when you hold a stone uh, in water, it looks so much more colorful. Um, like water and transparent um, materials change the way that light passes through and hits objects. Like at 12 noon, as we've talked about, at 12 noon when the sun is directly um, overhead in the sky, if light passes through a body of water's surface um, and it will not be like disrupted and refracted right refracted it means like refraction this is the fraction um, from this sun point that the light is traveling at and then it is refractioned um, bounces away when it's reflected it's coming right back out but actually it doesn't get um, exactly reflected when it passes through water at 12 noon instead it hits the object directly so color underwater at 12 noon is um, optically the most brilliant so anyway this is how varnish operates with colors that are sunken in or um, just are not like reflecting their wavelengths back to the cones in your retinas as much so um, two coats of picture varnish should be enough for proper protection. You should wait until each layer of varnish is dried overnight before adding the second layer. And always use a separate brush for varnishing so that it is free from any pigment particles or anything else that could get stuck in the varnish. Uh, that would be terrible. So, um, Alkid. Varnishes, this one is not a varnish, uh, but Alkid varnishes are modern commercially produced varnishes that employ a form of some kind of Alkid for producing protective film. Alkid's, uh, Alkid's has good solvent, moisture, and UV light resistant. Alkid's are chemically modified vegetable oils which operate in a wide range of conditions and can be engineered to speed up the, um, well, engineered to accelerate the curing rate and thus harden faster. More expensive exterior varnishes employ alkyds made from high performance oils containing UV absorbers. This improves gloss retention and extends the lifetime of the finish. Various resins 
may also be combined with alkyds as a part of the formula, formula for typical oil varnishes that are commercially available. Resin. Many different kinds of resins can be used to create a varnish. Natural resin, resins used for varnish include amber, damar, copal, balsam, shellac. These are create, uh, varnish can also be created from synthetic resins such as acrylic, alkyd, and polyurethane. A varnish formula might not contain any added resins at all since drying oils can produce varnish all by themselves, or a varnish effect all by themselves. What's cool about um, resins is the way that they sink into the like uh, textures of things. They they level a lot, and when they level over an uneven surface, they get super glossy and shiny, which is hard to photograph, but is also um, operates a lot like totally flat water at 12 noon with the light passing directly through it. So they're really great for color. The other thing with resins that's so fun is you can like add like, you know, whatever you want into them. You can layer like, uh, like layers of glitter and resin you can um, you can put actual objects in resin. Resin is just like a whole fun art project that like is like more mixed media than it even is like painting at that point. So um, that's a lot of fun. Many options. Anything with lots of options is fun. So solvent um, mm, options, chaos, fun. So solvents um, originally were turpentine or alcohol used to dissolve resin and thin the drying oils. The invention of petroleum distillates has led to turpentine substitutes such as white spirit, paint thinner, and mirror, mineral spirit. Um, modern synthetic varnishes may be formulated with water instead of hydrocarbon solvents. So with these um, Petroleum distillate varnish or solvents, they are not tested by time, so I don't know what's going to happen to them in 400 years. Um, it'll, your life will turn into Helen of Troy. You will be a legend based on like a real character or like Jesus Christ, right? But not really, because um, Jesus wasn't a painter. So, anyway. Acrylic resin varnishes are typically waterborne varnishes with the lowest refractive index of all varnishes. Yeah, less refraction, more reflection. They are highly transparent. They resist yellowing. Acrylics have the advantage of water cleanup and lack of solvent fumes, but typically do not penetrate into wood as well as oils. Um, so varnishes obviously are also used on wood to make beautiful like lacquered wood. Love it. Um, so the acrylic varnishes are not so good for that. Varnishes offer dust resistance and harder surfaces than bare paint and they also have the benefit of the ultraviolet light resistors. Um, so there's also lacquer. Okay, lacquer is not the same as shellac. It does not it cannot be dissolved in alcohol. Um, it's dissolved in lacquer thinner. It's highly flammable. Um, you can spray it on. It's pretty nice. Um, but it's different from varnish in that it can be re-dissolved later by a solvent. And it does not chemically change to a solid like other varnishes. Um, so just one more thing about resin. One more thing about resin is that it is it can be solid. It's uh, in a solid form often, but it's um, it can also be a highly viscous substance of plant or synthetic origin that is convertible into polymers, so it polymerizes. Uh, resins are usually mixtures of organic compounds. Some natural resins, um, like a gum, can. Uh, drip from an almond tree. Okay, Human use of plant resins has a very long history that was documented in ancient Greece by Theophrastus. Theo 
Theophrastus. In ancient Rome, um, by Pliny the Elder, and especially in the resins known as frankincense and myrrh, prized in ancient Egypt, they smell amazing, burn them. Um, they're highly su prized substances and used in religious rites. The word resin comes from the French resin, or Latin resina, resin, um, which comes from Greek still, resin of the pine. So the word resin has been applied in the modern world to nearly any component of liquid that will set into a hard lacquer or enamel-like finish. An example is nail polish. Casting resins um, have also been given the name resin. So resins can be made from plants like frankincense. Um, and they can be made from amber. They can make, be made from uh, balsam from Peru. Smells really nice pitch. Um, they can be biodegradable and there's even polyresins which are hard synthetic resins for casting in molds. So Damar gum is a resin obtained from a tree in India and East Asia. It is produced by tapping the trees just like maple syrup but it is sometimes collected in fossilized form from the ground it varies in color from clear to pale yellow um, and let's see uh, yeah it can be dissolved in turpentine um, and it was introduced as a picture varnish Demar varnish was introduced as a picture varnish in 1826 so that's pretty long ago yeah like 200 years with that we kind of know what it does now um, you can actually even use Damar crystals to make Batik, which prevents uh, paraffin wax from cracking when it is drawn into silk or rayon. Um, encaustic paints are Damar crystals that are dissolved into beeswax with pigment. Um, and yeah, so anyway, that's probably a ton of information about resin that you didn't even ask about and now you know you're so smart so thanks for tuning in to episode 8 of Art with Joe Gamel hopefully this quarantine has felt a little bit more like a um, course in oil painting for you you now have a comprehensive understanding of how to select materials for your desired outcome and how to start and finish an oil painting so that it lasts for hundreds of years so Hopefully I'll see you at Moore or University City Arts League and uh, fortunately for you Pongo won't be there to distract you or make any sudden noises. Nothing stopping you from making your magnum opus now.